Here. Ted Bowman. Yes. So, Susan Dolan. Janet Emerson. Here. Lisa Emerson. Here. Jason Green. Steve Gunther. Here. Sandra Harwell. Here. Martha Mattella. Here. Charlotte Wilson. Here. Mark Moore. Here. Ray Jean Van Bussen. Present. Greg Walters. All right, just to uh, clean up a couple things uh, real quick. Um, Susan Dolan, I, I did go by her home a couple times and uh, try, to, try to get in touch with her by ringing the doorbell. It doesn't look like anybody was at home. So uh, I, I'm still very concerned that we all are, and hopefully we'll get some type of response here soon. So I you know, just thought I'd bring you all up to date on that. Uh, on tonight's meeting, uh, we're going to kind of weigh the three-minute rule a little bit, as long as it's not too long. But uh, just as a, a point of order, um, <coughs> the commission has done its final draft. What we're here tonight to do is to listen to uh, the citizens in response to the, the, the charter document. Uh, we won't be doing any voting tonight. We're here to listen to your comments to see how they might affect the charter, and then. We'll be doing the same thing on Monday evening here also. So, uh, and then after, uh, well, in the last hour of Monday's meeting, we will actually uh, then get back to business addressing all the comments and concerns of the citizens uh, to see if there is anything in the charter that we will need to uh, maybe redraft or at least re reward uh, in, some, in some type of order. So tonight, I mean, I'm, we're just really interested in hearing your comments and your concern, or your concerns, or your thoughts uh, for the charter itself. Uh, is there any comments uh, other than that from the commission? Okay. All right. Um, <coughs> Sue, so, you know, I know you were the first one here. That's right. I'm still writing. Okay. All right. Bill, are you Bill? Or do you want to speak? Or? <coughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the commission, thank you for affording me the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I appreciate uh, that. And uh, I have spoken to you a couple times before, and I still have points of contention in a couple areas with charter this way. I think a charter for a city would be something that's needed, been needed for a long time. It would be uh, enable us to do some things that we haven't been able to do as a city and give us some freedom that we haven't had uh, and more flexibility. But it also needs to be a, a good one that's best for the citizens, what's best for the citizens of this city. And one of my points of contention has to do with the requirement of residency for one person in the city, one unelected person, that being the city administrator. It would be my preference if every city employee lived here, every city employee, but our police officers do not have to, our EMS people don't have to, our parks department people don't have to, public works don't have to, finance people don't have to, the courts people don't have to, no one else. No other department head, no other employee. We have a small percentage of our employees that live within the city of Raytown. Some charter cities require all employees to live there. Some require some of the employees to live there. The argument that I've heard that you've looked at other charters and that most of the charter cities in Missouri require that residency requirement is just not a valid argument. The reason it's not a valid argument, because if you're going to use that argument, then you need to use that argument related to other areas in this charter also, and you haven't done that. There are many other charter cities that have provisions in those charters uh, for instance, an appointed chief of police. Almost all of them. But you've chosen not to do that. So what I'm saying is, you've chosen not to do that because you feel like that's in the best interest of our city. 
I'm assuming. But you need to apply that to everything. And I have sat in on a lot of interviews for department head positions in the city, a lot of interviews. We have an extremely difficult time getting qualified people that are uh, quality people to come to this city even to interview. Uh, we very, very seldom get anyone that's actually a Raytown resident to come and interview for any of those. And when they do, do it's normally someone that's actually not qualified at all. So I think we're hurting ourselves by doing that. I know there was some changes made uh, that appear to be some kind of compromise, but it isn't really because it's still restricting that, still making that residential <coughs> requirement not uh, meaningful. If you're going to do it, then allow your elected representatives to have the power they need to be able to waive that if they feel it's in the best interest of the city. You're not doing that. So you're taking that ability away from your elected representatives. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if you're going to have that provision in there for the residency, then allow your elected representatives to do what they know is best in the best interest because they're going to be in a position to be able to see that. And uh, the, other, the other thing I have a, that's problematic to me is <clears throat> the referendum, recall, ballot initiatives. Uh, look at the state of California. It's, it's havoc. Look at what they've been through because of those things. If you're going to have those in the charter, then put the bar high enough that it's not going to be a problem for our, for our city officials. And it's not going to be something that is going to paralyze our city, which it could. Then set that bar higher. I feel like it should be probably double what it is. The 8% should probably be 15 or 16%. <coughs> yeah. The other percentage should probably be at least 30% uh, for, for recall. I think you have that way too low. Uh, because, you know, you're talking about going out and getting petitions with signatures of people who, not people who vote necessarily, just people who are registered to vote. And you can get a lot of uninformed people to sign petitions. I see it done all the time. Get the numbers you need. Those are serious things. And if you're going to leave it in there, I would suggest you set that bar high enough <coughs> to, to not make it a problem for our city government. I, uh, I hope you will take these things into consideration. <coughs> and I really, as it stands right now, I want to let you know if this document stands as is, I cannot support it. I support 99.9% .9 of the <coughs> but I can't support those, those things. If you change those percentages and you at least allow the, <coughs> the city, all the aldermen in the city, to have the ability to weigh that resolution, <coughs> then I can support this. And I think there are many other citizens in our city who feel exactly the same way I do. But I want to give you my opinion. I hope you'll consider this. I hope you give it due consideration. Uh, we all want to do what's best for our city. And that should be the bottom line. So, you know, and we all take a charter would be good. Um, but uh, don't do something that's going to tie the hands of our city government. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And Bill, if you'd like to, I mean, we can uh, show you those percentages and how they relate to the actual number of votes uh, or signatures it would require. I mean, well, for example, yeah, it's re it yeah. related to to the registered voters. Right, because it is registered to the registered voters. And so I have a pretty good idea what those percentages would be. I mean, thirty percent. Just on recall alone would mean you'd have to have 5,000, over 5,000. And I think something that serious should require that. Absolutely. Thank you.
Ready? Did you want to come up and speak? Thank you. I don't think the system's on. No, it's not. We can hear you. <coughs> yeah, my voice is not too quiet. Uh, I want to, first of all, tell you all I think you did a great job. Bring forth a simple chart. With two exceptions. One I'm bringing forth tonight, and another one I'll bring forth Monday night because I'm still waiting for some information. In regard to an issue, initiative, referendum, and recall, I compared Raytown with other cities of approximate size. Now, Belton has a charter, and its population is under 24,000, okay? We are under 30,000, so 6,000 difference in population. Um, <coughs> the number of registered voters we have in Raytown, 16,682. It was late this afternoon when I got information regarding Belton's registered voters, which totaled 15,101. Now, when I first uh, decided to run for the charter, you all knew why. Because I wanted a simple charter. And I'm so glad to see that you've done that. Now, when it comes to Belton as compared to Raytown, they're asking for 10% of registered voters for a petition on initiative. 10% on referendum. 30% on recalls. Now when I was running for charter, I wanted 35% for recall, and I wanted 30% for referendum, and 20% for initiative. I will compromise. I will agree to 10% for registered voters, 10%, I mean for initiative, 10% for referendum, and 30% for recall. The city of Raymore likewise has a charter. You didn't show it. You didn't give us an opportunity to see the charter for Raymore. Why? I don't know. You did give me information on uh, cities with charters way out in the boondock somewhere. But when it comes to Raymore, their population 19,550. For initiative, 10% of registered voters. Referendum, 10% of registered voters. Recall, 30% of registered voters. Now the only reason I'm really concerned when it comes to initiative, <coughs> referendum, and recall is why this charter ever got on the ballot in the first place. And you all know why. There are a number of members on that chart, on this charter right now, that wanted to get back at the city, to get rid of some of our officials, to make some major changes as a result of the Walmart grocery problem. Vinny, can I interrupt you, please? Yes. I mean, we, we are only asking for things that deal with what we're dealing with. But okay. I can't now my concern about special interest groups who might mit manipulate a poorly informed public to sign a petition without educating the public regarding the reason for the petition and if it is in the best interest of the citizens of Raytown. That's why I brought that subject up. <coughs> and I also want to know why didn't the Raytown Charter website allow people to add comments? It's so stated. You do not have permission to add comments. I think it would have been better had the public had that opportunity to do so. <coughs> now the cost of placing referendum initiative or recall on the ballot could easily cost $30,000 or more. Securing fewer percentages of signatures in order to place it on the ballot <coughs> would result in a number of issues going to the ballot box and costing the city and the residents more money. So consider what it's going to cost the city if we have many more petitions coming before the voters, being placed on ballot to increase the cost to the city and to 
the residents of the city of Radio. I'll see you back tomorrow night. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Just to let you know, I did review the rate, uh, rainwater charter and the development charter, both of them, when we were looking at the initiative referendum and recall. Okay, thank you. I've actually got copies of them. You agree that they did ease ask for the percentages are presented to you? Well, I'd have to go back and take a look at it again, yeah. but I don't have it in front of me. Well, I've got it right here. Okay, uh, Sue, are you ready to speak yet? If not, sure. I'll go on to anybody else that would like to speak. Somebody else wants to comment on that. I want to um, support what the last two have said. I have no problem with 99% of the charter. I think it's a well-constructed, it's simple, it's a workable document. I think that the problem, there's <coughs> two problems. One is I, I don't agree with requiring the city administrator to be a resident, be simply because what we'll end up with is <coughs> an individual who's willing to work, live in Raytown, but may not be the most qualified. And I think it's a requirement of the Board of Aldermen to bring the most qualified individuals into the city to help run it. But they don't have to come. They don't have to apply. And if they're going to be required to move to Raytown, <coughs> what we end up with is what's left over. We can offer them a good salary, but if they don't want to live here, they're not going to apply. I think we're wrong in, in believing that Raytown is such a jewel that everybody's going to want to come and live here for the money. So I think you need to, you can include that residency <coughs> requirement, but you have to give the Board of Aldermen, who is the law, you know, the governing body of this city, give them the right to pick and choose. At some <coughs> point down the road, a year, two years, five years, ten years, long after this is all over with, they have to have the flexibility to say, yes, we like that guy because the rest of them are all duds. So we got it, you got to include that. Otherwise, you're shortchanging. And the and the people on this commission that are part of the Board of Aldermen, they have the duty, they've sworn their duty to, to, to make the city the best place, to bring the best people to this city in order to do our business. And as a resident, I, I'm going to hold it, them to that. But if you tell them, if you take that right away from them, that ability to excuse that uh, residency requirement, we are going to end up with less than the best qualified for our city. It's going to cost us money in some fashion or another. Wrong decisions, wrong <coughs> qualifications, poor judgment, or no experience, it's going to cost us money. The other thing I want to talk about is just like everybody else, the referendum, the petition, and the recall. Let's call recall what it is. It's revenge. It's easy to work up a bunch of people over a single issue and go out and get a small number of signatures when there's no downside to that process to the people who started, but yet all of the aldermen will be operating under that umbrella of, we're going to get you if you don't do what we want. That's what the election process is for, not re the recall. If the aldermen are crooks, if they, if they overstep their boundary, there are laws, there are ordinances to remove them. If a group of people are completely upset with it all, <coughs> then prove it. Go out and get 30%. Make it a substantial number. Otherwise, the Board of Aldermen will always be trying to appease
some small group of people. And let's say what it is. If you go out and get 17%, 17% of 100 people is only 17. Well, at this point, we have to decide what's the most important number. This percentage, which sounds grand, or what does that percentage actually translate into it when it comes to signatures? You could go up to Walmart or up to Hy-Vee and stand up there and say, are you a resident? And you could gather signatures all day long <coughs> without putting a whole lot of effort in. So at that point, I think the recall needs to be 30%. The referendum, the, the petition initiative, I don't really have a problem with 8%. I'd like to see it higher because it proves those group of people have put in the time, put in the effort, and educated a group of people to bring that. But that is not as damaging as recall. We will end up not having anybody want to run for Board of Aldermen because if we get a history of recalls, you're going to start seeing the people that actually live in this city that would like to serve this city start turning their backs on the election process because all of a sudden now, the election process means absolutely nothing. So what? So you get elected. In six months, some goofball bunch of people can go out and get a bunch of signatures and drum up some reason why you're, they're unhappy with you. It doesn't even have to be against the law. It just has to be they're unhappy. And then all of a sudden you have, just like, I know you want to hear it, but just like with the Walmart deal, that process, there was name calling, there was lawsuits threatened over some stupid little thing like that. Well, just multiply that by everyday business. Because there was no recall there except on the state level. But now we're going to bring that into our city and make it law. We need to make, I, when I first heard about it, I said, let's make it 50%. Let's make it something that people have to work for, not as a hobby. Not let them just dabble in politics. Because when, those, when that dabbling gets done, that group of people all go home. They all watch TV and shut their front door and couldn't care less about whatever else goes on. And all of a sudden now we're left with a city with nowhere to go. Gridlocked. So we need to reconsider those two points. Because that will cost us money, it will cost us people. And, and we are not that big of a city that we can survive spending a lot of money that we don't have. Thank you, Chair. Dave McCauley. Oh, that's right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. I want to share this, Dave, with you. Supposing the Board of Aldermen chooses to ignore something in this charter, they're, they're just going to ignore it <coughs> upon their way and do what they want. Does that constitute uh, moral turpitude in commission of their duties as Aldermen? Again, without a specific section reference. Okay. So, I mean, that would be because the terms are used in different contexts. Okay. And, and I think 
So essentially, <coughs> what, what happens if a board of aldermen just completely chooses to ignore, or a particular board um, member chooses to ignore um, something in this charter document, then what's the what's the outcome of that? Or how is that? I guess you have to look at a, a different number of steps. First, the board of aldermen is the judge of the qualifications of its board and has the ability to remove members. Okay. So if the body thought that that had occurred, okay. they could remove an individual member. Okay. If collectively it's being ignored, so you have one alderman uh, exhibiting bad behavior, uh, for whatever reason the rest of the board's not really happy, that is where recall then becomes an appropriate uh, response. response of people saying, and, and that's really, regardless of where you set the bar on those three things, part of what that is doing is putting a check and balance that doesn't currently exist in the hands of the electorate in Raytown saying, you know, we trust you guys, you're going to do the best you can, um, but every once in a while, for whatever reasons, it may not work, so now there is a fail safe, and then it's a matter of making sure you're, you've got the bar at the appropriate place. Perfect. Okay. Um. Let's see, I, I don't know, did you all talk at all about requiring a balanced budget for the general fund? And, and a lot of my comments here are just not live or die issues. I'm just curious to know if that came up in the discussion. And I know there's reasons why you can't always or shouldn't always have a balanced budget and it kind of becomes a policy statement. <coughs> I, I just didn't know if that's a we, we didn't address the balanced budget, just that they would have to provide a budget for approval. For the board of aldermen. Go ahead. Yes. Missouri law requires every city to have a balanced budget. Perfect. So, so it's really not an issue. Okay. Okay. Um, in, in addition, in your first question, uh -huh. under uh, vacancies and forfeiture of office, it specifically says that a, an alderman violating a prohibition in the charter. forfeits their office. Now the alderman would have to judge that as a group. Okay. But but it specifically says violating prohibitions of this charter um, will result in a forfeiture. Perfect. Thank you. I missed that in the reading. Um, let's see. Um, passing ordinances, um, the, the, the way, and I'm basing a lot of this, you know, of course on on my personal experience uh, being on the board, but passing the ordinances um, in one meeting, I know there's often times that either because of a developer coming in or um, you know, even in times of the tax library based on the city's budget time frame and the time it takes to get the numbers back from the county on what's gonna be levied, that a lot of times an ordinance would have to be read for the second time in the evening. And I just want to make sure that there is some allowance for doing that in this document. So, um, because a number of times that comes up. The way so, the requirements for the... To read it twice. That, right. one, that it can be read once. And twice in the second time. In the same meeting. Right. Yeah. Same as before. Huh? It's the same as before. Okay. Perfect. And Alan, you would have to... No, it's, it's, it's written that way already. Okay, perfect. Again, um, it's got some special parameters, but then that's pretty common too. So okay. I think it's good. <coughs> um, it also talks about appointment of a city attorney, um, and I think the city prosecutor shall serve for two years. In the event they don't, does that matter if they cannot or don't? Uh, again, vacancies get filled. And in this case, the alderman picked them, and so the alderman would pick the backups. Okay, but this is requiring the whatever contract be entered into between the prosecutor and the city attorney that the city offers that for a two-year period. It's actually an office. They're being appointed to an office. That office has fixed terms, and okay. so those terms will never change. Once you establish the first one, it's always going to be for a two-year period. Okay. And the other thing, it's, it's set up so that they can serve um, multiple consecutive appointments. Okay, excellent. Um, does the current 
police chief will have the cops on the board possess all the qualifications that you guys require. <coughs> I see very clearly that it talks about the judge uh, being considered a part-time position. However, I don't see where it in turn requires the police chief to be a full-time position. And obviously we've had that history here in Raytown. Say that again, full-time. It's, the charter makes very clearly that the judge is a part-time position, but I don't see the mirrored language requiring that the police chief be a full-time position. Um, you know, and with our history in Raytown, <coughs> before, I, I think the intent, especially by the outline of all of this, ifs, ands, and buts that you have to have for a police chief, <coughs> the intent and the pay scale means you should have the police chief being a full-time position. So I just bring that up for your all's consideration. Um, <coughs> <laughs> and I guess another point of clarification, talking about the declaration of candidacy. Um, <coughs> for the Board of Aldermen. Uh, says that they cannot... You see a requirement for Board of Aldermen members? Um, yes. Um, it talks about their declaration of candidacy, um, something about, about the current election they can't file for another for another alert, where is that you guys have? Um, She's looking at that. Um, on page three, there's a prohibition in 3.5 for holding other offices. No alderman shall hold any other city office or city <coughs> employment during the term held on the board of aldermen. Is that what you're asking about? Uh, office to be filled at the same election. Um, I just want to make sure there's a prohibition that a person can't hold one office and then turn around two years later and file for another office. They can't. Yeah, that's, I, I, we're in right town, honey. <laughs> I, I, just, I, think, I think they can. I think given the way we've written it, they can run, but if they win, they have to give up they would have the, to previous yeah. the previous office. But okay. what this prohibits is from them filing for two offices in the same election. Okay. Like alderman or mayor. So, so if, if an alderman wanted to run for mayor and was only halfway through their term, right. they could do that, they could but do they that. could not hold both positions. Perfect. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you guys um, a little bit again about what I brought up, and I'm sorry I didn't stick around for the balance of that meeting to hear the answer, regarding um, the mayor having some input in who the Board of Aldermen um, places in the event of a vacancy. Again, I would advocate, because I think what that's going to do is require that the mayor and the Board of Aldermen work together towards that appointment. I, I heard that it was brought up that a mayor can just simply, you know, leave a seat vacant if he doesn't like, you know, whatever, and the politics that go on with that. That could be rounded by requiring the seat to be filled within 90 days. Um, and in some of this segues into other thoughts regarding Raytown technically, I guess, has a weak mayor. <coughs> and I think large
largely, as I understand it, it's construed that we have a weak mayor system in that the mayor is not given a vote um, with, the, with the board. So, but also in a fourth class city, um, technically a mayor, even though it's technically a weak mayor, it really acts more as a strong mayor type of a system. I, I think all of us know that historically. Um, so I just might have you guys um, consider that or relook at that issue in particular of, of giving a mayor the opportunity to have some hand in appointing a, a vacancy towards the board. And Alan, so, I think you can address this because we talked about it. I, did. I think he already is the one that appoints. No, no this is the exception to that. This is when there's a vacancy on the board, and what is written <coughs> is the board runs the process and fills the seat. There is no role as written <coughs> the mayor in that process. And our discussion, if you'll recall, was that informally it doesn't keep the mayor from soliciting people to try to get the seat because there's no specified, this is exactly how you would fill the vacancy. All it says is it's the board of aldermen that's going to do all that with no specific role for the mayor. If you change and add the mayor in it, um, what you have to realize, this whole process is a balancing act. Once you put the mayor in, um, and you can construct your scenarios with everybody's friendly, everybody hates everybody, I mean, and everything in between, but the mayor can pick somebody that would change the balance of the council even though it's just one seat, assuming that you have one of those councils where, where it's, there, there's two or three swing people and let's say the swing person leaves and now you're going to appoint and you appoint a non-swing person, you've just changed the dynamic of the board. If the mayor has to make the appointment, then the mayor can nominate one or a series even of people that will change that balance. And all the board could do is reject the nominees if you put the mayor in. If you leave the mayor out, the same thing will occur, but it will be strictly the board player's <coughs> influence to try to affect the outcome. So it really is a how do you want it to play out because you will get quite different behavior with the mayor having to nominate and then get it approved, which is kind of the appointment process or the mayor has to use informal means because it is a seat that belongs to the body and the body is going to pick the successors. So, uh, as written, the mayor doesn't have a role. If you want to give the mayor a role, you need to consider how, how will that change the dynamic if the event occurs. And the event will always occur. That's the other thing I will tell you. That, particularly with four-year terms and ten people sitting in the chairs for, for the four years, Life will happen to somebody during almost every cycle of a mayor's term. There will be a time when somebody has to leave early, somebody has health issues. I mean, all kinds of things happen. Mr. Chair. And, and I suppose what I'm proposing in that regard, how I feel about it anyway, requires that the mayor and the board work together. Because obviously, <coughs> there's going to be the politics that go on behind the scene. And, and I don't think any mayor in the right mind would bring out somebody's name as a sacred lamb <coughs> to force a board to vote down and embarrass that person publicly, you know. So that is my thought again in regard to that. But if you make sure that the, the seat is filled, so at least you block that potential game, um, that the mayor and board work together in terms of filling, filling that seat. Um, so I'll throw that out there. The other thing, uh, you know, back to what I was talking about in terms of, you know, the weak mayor, strong mayor system. And again, this is based on, on my personal experience. Um, and the caveat to that is that, that, that your, particularly your senior uh, uh, positions in City Hall have a tendency to turn over uh, whenever there's a new mayor. It's just bound to happen. People are going to look for greener pastures and not feel welcome or it's a time for a change and, you know, new mayors want to bring their own people in, what have you. So it, it just happens. Um, you know, it happened prior to me, it happened during my term. Um, I 
personally served as uh, city administrator the first year or year and a half of my term in office. We did not have a city administrator at the time. Um, you know, there had been some turnover of staff from the prior administration. We were looking to fill those. It took about a year, a year and a half for Eric P to enter us and look for you know, who we thought the right person was to fill that position. So again, I would say to a consideration of <coughs> Um, if you start losing staff, the city administrator is gone. Um, I know we've had, I think, turnover of maybe four finance directors. What the city administrators will tend to do is appoint kind of the next person in the chain of command down the line as their acting city administrator. But if you end up with a, a, a situation where you have literally turnover in all of those, those departments, um, and you're having, having to scramble for outside, you know, you might have to hire a company to handle the finances because I think even recently when a finance director was not filled, the uh, economic development director was filled. I doubt he feels very competent or, or knowledgeable to be able to handle that role for an extended period of time. So you're likely going to look to be outsourcing, you know, those sorts of services until those positions can be filled. But it also gives you an opportunity if you have some expertise, either from the mayor or even a board of aldermen member, um, just some flexibility in terms of being able to fill those positions. And a as I read this, you know, what's written here, um, uh, you know, you're given the mayor very, um, you know, limited duties, I guess, um, or and, and everybody pretty limited duties and it, you know, no administrative duties beyond serving as the board. Well, like I said, I served as, as a, a city, uh, city administrator. Also, uh, you know, kind of we shared the hat of economic development director. We didn't have one at the time. So, uh, you know, and I know that position isn't ratified in this charter, but I'm just saying you might consider being able to give some flexibility of who, in fact, is appointed in <coughs> of those positions not being there. So, my spousal unit is scrunching his forehead at me, so. <laughs> Do you not have a clue what I'm talking about? Right. <laughs> <laughs> in, in short, you want some means by which appointed positions are filled by somebody in particular? Uh, by an elected official, if and, and preferably the mayor, in my mind, only because that's what I lived, but opening my mind to the possibility, it, why couldn't it be someone on the board of aldermen? So somebody will have to help me with this, but in our discussions, at least in some place in here, and I don't know if we did it with everyone, we required a, uh, a plan for uh, continuous, yeah, yeah. continued Succession plan? There's a succession plan requirement under city administrator, city clerk, and they have to have it filled out and on file. And they have to tell the city right. council what right. that right. succession and, plan is. And they, they have to have it. So the, the provision is really in there for what I guess were considered fairly critical offices that you have to have a succession that in plan. place. Um, <coughs> so theoretically, that should eliminate the need, assuming that plan gets written in it's made known. I just can't remember if we did it for every position. I know we did it for several of them, but I can't remember if we made a general remark about it. No, it wasn't general, no. It was to those critical ones. And then we put it in the police chief and the city administrator and apparently the city clerk. <coughs> and and this, the city administrator, through the role of his office, will be able to handle many of those other positions. That's assuming you have a city administrator. And then you're well, down to the line of succession. Well, if the building the burns down, it's assuming if we have a city hall, <coughs> you know, okay. we can right. overreach that. I'm just telling you that was practical, <coughs> practical experience, and it can happen. Yeah, I've got a so. question for Alan. Uh, under 4.3, duties and responsibility, we actually say, uh, under B, we actually say that the mayor is a member of the board of aldermen. So what would keep him from also uh, suggesting possible appointments for the Board of Aldermen to consider for a you, did, you didn't finish reading the sentence. <laughs> yeah, the chairman. 
So it's a limited membership. Mm -hmm. He only gets to participate in the survey or she in a certain way. But again, the practical piece is that if, if you think about this process, and I've, I've seen it more than a couple of times, um, there's a general scrambling to find people by everybody. I mean, not just the elected officials. Everybody starts scrambling saying, how do we fill this seat? <coughs> then, uh, most of the time, the board or the council, in cities where it's called a council, will declare this is the process we're going to use. And they don't always use the same process every time in the same city. So they say, okay, this is the process. Often driven by how far it is to the <coughs> election where they can have people sign up and go through a, an election process. So they declare a process, which may be anybody who wants to fill out a form and apply and say, I'd like to have the seat, to you've got to get two people. I've, I've seen this one where you couldn't just be nominated by one person. You had to get two people to say, yes, I think this person should be considered for the open seat. So all of that is left to the board to decide how they want to do it. So uh, again, the, the question you really have to answer is, is do you think the mayor needs a charter protected role in order to influence the process? So. And that's pretty much what it is. So. Um, Actually, I wish Ted, if I could. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can say, I, I remember it being in place for the um, city clerk and the city administrator. We, did we have that in place for a list of people that... I, I remember <laughs> I, I remember writing it when I wrote the section about the police chief. I remember us discussing it. It would be on page 16. In a couple of others. It's on page 16. What's on page 16? I'm saying if it were to be there. It's actually on page 14 for the police chief, 63B. Continuity of services. Yes, so and then it's, it's apparently duplicated for... Oh, I see. My pages are numbered differently, that's all. And I think it's by ordinance and wouldn't be appropriate in the charter. You, a mayor does establish a line of succession. Um, you know, each year you fill out who should act in your stead, and that may or may not be the pro town. So, uh, and I think that's handled by, by ordinance. But anyway, but the mayor that. still has the power to appoint with the consent of the board of all Right. You know, all the members of the committee's advisory committees and stuff like that. Too. Right. So that, that is exactly. right. only the, and, and like I said, these aren't live or die issues. Right. I just want you guys to understand. I know you tried to model this as closely as possible to how the city's currently doing business. So I just wanted to point those considerations out. And, you know, and, all, and obviously, I, mean, I think you guys have done a great job with this document. It's a living document. If the city runs into issues, things can be changed in the future, you know, given the initiative referendum and recall. Speaking of that, um, you know, I know folks voice some strong opinions here. As I read this, um, I think you guys have 8% required for initiative and referendum. Um, now, is that 8% then of the citywide? registered voters, or is it 8% of the voters registered within someone's ward? So 8% of the registered voters within a particular ward are looking for a recall. Well, I guess it's 17.5%. Well, 17.5% for recall, yes. But that's within that ward. No. That yes. Is, yeah, that's, 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 what, that's what we corrected because yeah. initially it was a citywide number of right. nine to a ward because they would be the only ones who could do it. And so it was corrected so that the 17 and a half is tied to the office. If it's a citywide office, it's a citywide calculation. Okay. If it's a ward only, it's calculated within that ward. Okay. And in light of that, I know I, I, it seems to me maybe Ward 4 has the largest number of voters. Um, and I didn't hear the <coughs> so what he shared that tonight, you know, the number of citywide registered voters. Um, uh, 
for the initiative referendum. <coughs> uh, when you come down to a particular board, I, I know anybody that's ran for office, and maybe you all running for a charter, you go out and knock on the door, and you find out there's no registered voters there, or you get the walking lists, and you know, house after house after house, there's no registered voters. So I would just want to, in light of the concerns that have been expressed here tonight, make sure that the numbers are adequate, even in wards that may have very low um, registered voters. So that, because obviously we want to make it high enough that we don't drive everybody crazy and pay for tons and tons of elections, but it still has to be obtainable. You know, on a citywide election, uh, calculated difference would be 1334 versus 1668 based on these numbers. You know, it's a lot of signatures getting 1,300 signatures. I mean, anybody that's worked with petition, that's a lot of signatures. I don't have a problem with that. I, but I also wouldn't have a problem with it being 10% and requiring 300 more, you know. But anyway, I would just want to make sure that per board, based on registered voters, that there's a high enough number that it's, you know. Well, and let me clarify too. We not only looked at it this way, but we compared the number that we were coming up with for a citywide registered voters with what was actually for what were actually voting numbers previous, like this past April, it was 1,900 or <coughs> almost 2,000 voters came right. out. Right. Well, if you want 17 and a half percent of recall, you got to get another thousand signatures. Besides just what came out. Exactly. <laughs> right. So, I right. mean, we we looked at this and. There were so many aspects to try to make sure that we were really balanced to make it difficult enough that just somebody isn't just going to do something. Yet. So I you know, I mean, yeah. We could be wrong. I mean, uh, of all the charter uh, revisions that I've seen in, in charters where they have actually gone through <laughs> a, a, a revision process, this seems to be the one area that they tend to revise most often is either they've had too much difficulty getting a recall or it's been too easy or something like that. And we looked at those charters and we looked at those revisions and tried to compare. I mean, we didn't take this number <laughs> at all. I just want to let everybody know that. And now we can even speak to the numbers as to his thoughts on them. So, okay. Okay. Um, again, regarding, I think a couple of you weren't here Wednesday, regarding the city administrator, I personally believe the city administrator um, should live in the city. Um, obviously, I, and it, I also don't know that it's an issue that we have to die on the sword for. I'd really, really like to see a, a charter, and I still would encourage you guys to consider making it a pullout issue where people vote, then you actually need to know how important is this to the city citizens of Raytown, whether or not they live here or not. I think the vast majority of people, at least that I've spoken to, think the city administrator should live here. However, I've also spoken to people that, that just think that it's not necessary, so there's good arguments on both sides and, and for what that's for. So thank you guys for your time. Thank you, sir. Michael, you got some questions? Yeah, a couple areas. <coughs> I want to, of course, I take the other side. I don't go so far as to say we will get a bad city administrator if we require them to live here, because we won't, for certain. What we will do is limit or reduce the number of candidates. So our choices are going to be smaller. We may be lucky. We may not. But we definitely limit people who cannot easily move their location due to some simple things like spouse, children in the schools, or mortgage situation. And the last one is a big one anymore for a lot of people. You can't move easily. You can't get out of your mortgage and sell your house. Uh, it's interesting that the judges are required to live in the city. The prosecutor isn't required to live in the city. And the uh, city attorney is not required to live in the city. Now, all of those things are probably because we want to ensure a level of expertise that overrides the, the warm feeling we have of them being part of our communities. <coughs> to 
me, we want the best possible employee. And the only legitimate requirement for residency to me is first responders <clears throat> need to be close enough to take care of an emergency. They don't even need to live in the city, but they need to at least live close enough to the city so that if we have a fire disaster, well, not fire, a police disaster, I guess, or an EMS disaster, those people need to be close enough to uh, respond quickly. The, as far as term limits and initiative, uh, recall referendum, maybe the recall could be a little higher, but if it becomes a problem, we can always have a, have a change. Uh, one of the things that bothers me, though, is looking at Article 6, Chief of Police, especially under eligibility, <coughs> uh, almost everything with, uh, with item 6 also. Uh, candidates for the chief of police shall possess considerable knowledge in the principles of modern police administration and police <coughs> methods. Now that sounds very nice, but it also sounds very vague. Who judges that? Almost every every one of the six points here is vague enough that we will have someone else mentioned earlier potential for litigation. Now, it may not affect us directly. It may be one group files a lawsuit against a candidate or files a lawsuit against an existing police chief saying, well, he doesn't meet my recruitment. <coughs> Knowledge of standards uh, by which the quality of police service is evaluated. Knowledge, no. A test on an ACT, that's a measurable thing. Just saying the word knowledge is very subjective. Plus, some of this, I'm sorry, I don't really care if he understands how to shoot a pistol because I don't expect my police chief to be out there patrolling the, the streets with a pistol. He's an administrator. So some of these requirements are really not germane to the role we would have as, as, as an administrative official that runs our police department. This, this, it's like this, these are, there's pages of definitions in here on the police chief, and a lot of them are, like I say, vague and could lead to litigation. Thank you. I can, I, I can answer one of your questions pretty easily. Uh, <coughs> all the, uh, the contract employees that you're talking about are elected officials, like the city attorney, the city prosecutor, and judge. Those are all part-time positions, and those people also do work in other cities. Yeah. And so that there would be no way of requiring residency for them to live here. Why? Well, because if they do work in other cities, I mean, would those cities want to also have them? Well, then it's just like you can't get out of your, you can't get out of your mortgage. Well, you can't hold two jobs. I mean, we would just limit ourselves to judges that don't have a residency requirement with some other city. Just like we limit offices so that you can't hold two offices. I mean, yes, it makes sense, but, but it also makes sense that we not require people that can't get out of their mortgage to move to Ray County. <laughs> Part of it being part-time just is another factor of their situation. I, I, I understand why we would want to grant them an exception, but I think it's no more important than why we would be able to grant a city administrator an exception for reasons <coughs> not exactly the same, but also a problem. Otherwise, why can't we find somebody qualified that's willing to live in right now or go to... It's okay. We get your point. Yep. Yeah. Randy, Diane, any questions for us? Uh, Ted, did you possibly might want to address some of Michael's questions regarding the police chief? That there's too many candidate qualifications? Yeah, qualifications. 
in their aspect of knowledge? No, I think that's, I got most of those from uh, um, either Belton's or from the current qualifications. Um, and I think the answer to who judges that is, uh, uh, we, we discussed at length here. Um, and I, I just, I don't know that there's anything else to say. In fact, I believe he was here for those discussions. Hello. <coughs> so. Just because Belton does it, doesn't mean it's wise that for us. That wasn't the argument, Michael. Huh? That wasn't the argument, Michael. Okay. I, I answered where, where I collected those things mm -hmm. to try to make it comprehensive. I, and if, if the point is that there's too many uh, qualifications in there, okay. No, no, it's not that the, there's too many, but there is <coughs> no objective way of judging what constitutes a adequate knowledge or a... Uh, I think the police officer's board of standards and training might dis disagree with you, but... Who, who does the interview process for this? For the it's, it's elected, sir. It's still, it's still listed in here as elected. The, the candidate's responsible for meeting those uh, qualifications and then runs a campaign and, and gets voted on. So if he's elected, how could there be, how could there be any litigation? If, I mean, if the it, would only be, it would only be if somebody tried to claim that he wasn't qualified to begin with, which would, which would probably, I would assume, as has been in the past, be part of the election argument. Well, part I would of the say campaign. you go to a lot of small towns around southern Missouri and <coughs> western Kansas, and their police chiefs are probably just one or one or two steps removed from a patrolman. So I mean, I, if, I mean, I'm arguing with you here. Well, if how, even how can you how can you set that? If, if even that, yeah, I mean, it's it's not necessary in some places that you have any any at all. I mean, it's dependent upon the duties, and the reason that we wrote this here was to make the differentiation between the idea that that it's it's a ceremonial position or a working position. Um, the uh, if it wasn't a ceremonial position, like say, it wouldn't then it, matter. Then it shouldn't be a voted. It should not be an elected position. It should be a qualified <coughs> interview process position. If if you see what I mean, I mean right. I, the the only thing that we were looking at here was that the substantial change between going from an elected police chief to an appointed police chief has been one of the bone and contentions with past uh, charters. And, and I was asked by another charter commission member, what, you know, what, why should we elect versus vote? Or why should we elect versus appoint? And my position on that is that I don't have a position. I can live with it either way. Right. Uh, be, but as far as putting together a charter, the important part was not to uh, deviate from what we currently have because most of us sitting up here, <coughs> that's what we were going to try to sit here and do. And so it's still elected, and, and that was my simple answer. Um, I think that uh, I think that by setting the the eligibility standards there, the attempt was to make it clear that this is uh, a police chief in a place where being police uh, chief requires more than than just being an untrained person. In fact, it requires in here that within six months they have to be certified as a peace officer in the state. So that I don't have any problem with. The part I have problem with is terms considerable knowledge of, because that is vague. Who decides? The voters will. But you're not. S <laughs> All right, Jim, you got a you got a response. I do. It's my understanding that the there's a clear difference between a criminal suit and a civil suit. The case of the law or crime, I am. Innocent until proven guilty. But vice versa, if Ted were elected chief and I chose to sue him, then he has to prove he's not guilty. Meaning that he has to show, prove to me that he has the knowledge and basically meets all those qualifications as listed. The key question here is, I guess I would ask the attorney, is, he goes to court, how would the court probably just say, okay, Ted, this is how you will prove it? I think that's what what like is considerable knowledge? Yeah, he's he's got a you know what where you know where is rent court now and how's he going to do it? 
And well, I guess it's up to the judge. And, and if it's a civil suit, the whole preponderance of the evidence one way or the other changes. I mean, in a, in a, in a, in a criminal suit, you know, you have to have, you know, a certain bar of, of jurors that say, yeah, we believe he's guilty. But in a civil suit, you don't, it doesn't, that, that goes out the window, a lot of that. I, I mean, think in a they, civil suit, I think you could have a jury. But yeah, but how did they, chosen. just, just, get, they didn't, they didn't convict OJ for criminal, but they convicted him for civil. Because the, the difference in the, the level I mean, of evidence required changes when you go from one to the other. So it just trickles down to what I said. Who will decide whether he has <laughs> met those qualifications as listed by a charter? How will that be done? I think that's what Michael will say. Does anybody have an answer for that? Well, I'll, I'll give you some answers. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm answering the exact questions. I'll, I, I will go through what I think would happen. Okay, first of all, you have to remember it's an elected official. So in order to get elected, you have to run for office. Anybody who runs against you can challenge your eligibility before the election. <coughs> so if they thought somebody signed up and was running who did not meet the qualifications, you can have a pre-election suit. And the burden is still going to be on the person challenging. They're going to have to bring forth enough to keep the suit from just being tossed out. Okay, assuming that it's not that scenario, the person gets elected and then it's discovered they falsified their uh, <coughs> history, their licensing, whatever. If they're missing a qualification, they're subject to removal without somebody else bringing the lawsuit because you have to have the eligibility. In terms of the level, have to remember it's an elected position uh, because you can. You know, what has occurred here is there's a higher bar, frankly, to be a candidate for the police chief's role than there is to be on the board of aldermen. Um, you have to have the residency, you have to have all of this licensing, but it's not an exact test. If you've got elected and, and I want to say you're qualified and somebody else wants to say you're not or vice versa, the court's going to be predisposed to support the decision of the people. So they're not going to cancel out what the electorate did at an election unless there is solid grounds. So while these appear to be vague, um, they're going to force candidates to address those <coughs> issues. This is why I meet those things. So you're going to get that in the campaign. And as long as I have some. And even if you're hiring a police chief, you're not going to see a lot of difference in this because if you think about uh, large police departments, and we sit in the, the shadow of the Kansas City Police Department, you can go all the way through there, you can achieve high rank and never do two-thirds of the tasks that are involved in running a police chief. But most of us would say, well, that person's qualified to be a police chief because they've obviously been doing police work for 30 years. So I think the standards... <coughs> are a little bit vague, but they probably have to be because you're going to run an election against those. If you were writing these for an appointed <coughs> police chief, two things I would tell you. One is, if and when the people decide that they wanted to have an appointed police chief, this whole section will shrink to a very short section, and all of those qualifications will move back into the ordinance writing, job description writing of the city. Uh, they will no longer be out here. Because you're keeping the appointed position, what is written, I think, does a lot to protect the city against, and, and I've seen this, I shared with some of you, I think, in uh, the county I used, used to practice in, uh, the annual, or the annual, the periodic run for sheriff attracted anybody who could go in and sign up, and we'd have, you know, a dozen or more candidates, many of which had no qualification, um, but the truth was, at that time, to run for sheriff, other than some disqualifying factors. Anybody that wanted to be sheriff could run to be sheriff. So this is saying, <coughs> no, you can't just have open season, go be a police chief. You're going to have some criteria. So I think it's, it's again, striking a balance. I think it's done it. I don't think you're going to see any litigation except for somebody misrepresents that they have some qualities that are mentioned and it turns out they had none of the above. I think anything else most attorneys would look at it and say that's a loser to go challenge that. Uh, it may turn out that they can't operate well, 
but that's a different situation. One, one of the you know, battle cries that I've heard during these hearings are the fact that this would other cities do, other cities do this. And I, at the last meeting, I heard our attorneys say Independence had a police oversight committee. Um, you didn't say that? I don't think I said that. I heard that from far somebody. Far as, far as who, who's the other attorney? Hmm? Who was the other attorney? <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my evil twin? Yes. Are you familiar with Independence? Do they have a police oversight committee? Yes, they do. I don't, I don't think they have a police oversight committee in a meaningful fashion. I mean, they I know. Police I, board, I think. Because I called them to see if they had an elected or appointed chief. And they told me they had an appointed chief. And I'm sure they told me they had a police board. There is a we'll personnel board that addresses some things. But it's not, in the classic sense of an oversight board, it doesn't meet what I would call an oversight board that's looking at the whole operation of a police department. Who would be interested to consider adding a police board to our charter? And, and I and I agree with that too, but I, I believe that doing it in this initial charter um, is deviating too far from trying to keep it simple and trying to keep it the way it is right now. So that it's good easy point. to understand and, and easy to get on the ballot and easy for people to deal with. That's a good point. <coughs> Nobody has any oppositions to those ideas. It's just that in the initial charter that would probably not be a wise course of action. <coughs> All right, uh, does anybody have any other questions? What we're going to do is uh, consider all these uh, items that were brought up. Yes, Alan. I have an email from somebody who's not here that I thought I sh should make a okay. commission. So this is, I, I want to share with you, it's, it's from uh, Tom Colico. Some of you may know him. Uh, he works uh, at a company called Springstead. They do the financial advising for the city. Again, not city employees. This is a company that cities hire to help them when they start putting together financing. And uh, as I made you aware, I sent the provisions on initiative with the can do taxes and fees to uh, two law firms um, that have uh, participated in, in Ray Town issues in the past. And uh, to Tom, uh, or somebody that's come down won't, won't swear that I sent it directly to Tom. He's, he's, he's the one that then responded. And the points he made, and some of them we've discussed, were that um, would have concerns when they go to the bond market if the provisions cause the underwriters to get nervous um, about uh, the debt. And he would propose that and again, we, we've talked about the Constitution probably keeps you from doing any of that. But he thought it might be a good idea to include specific language. And what he suggested was uh, any taxes or fees pledged towards repayment of debt obligations are not subject to reduction or termination through initiative. And that's not a bad, basically it's what I told you. I thought you. we had done that. Huh? I thought we had. No, no, the that. Constitution did that. Okay. Okay. We and what he's saying is rather than rely on that, which I've advised you, so you guys know that, but nobody else knows that, <coughs> uh, is that we just add that statement to it. Uh, and again, after I sit down and you get into do you want to do things, I just wanted to put that on the list because he took the time to read that and, and to respond, and I think it was only fair to him to, to, to let you know. Um, and I'm sorry, Alan. His, his purpose is to is to keep that provision from from exciting uh, the, bond the bond market to yeah. the point that it that it might hurt the the, the bond credit market. rating. Okay. And so they're suggesting adding a couple of words or something. They they he had very specific words, and as you know, then I would modify them only slightly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to tell you, it, it it sounds vaguely familiar <coughs> to me in the arguments about the preamble. Um, it's been said here in state law, but we're going to say it here anyway. That's okay. Well, I, I see no problem. You, you also have to remember, too, I, and I don't know how many of you have ever tried to get an underwriter to accept something. <coughs> it's a pretty difficult task. They, they have rules that I can't even start to, to fathom. And uh, the nice thing about it is 
it doesn't do any harm to sure. what we thought we were doing. So I did want to want to share that uh, with you because his concern was for the city's well-being in terms of their credit rating uh, and what underwriters might see. It just takes that away. And it also, again, back to the other, keep it simple, it tells people right up front, you can't do this if they've already issued the bonds, so don't even try it. So I, I thought it was a good suggestion, and I, I wanted to honor the fact that, that somebody in a very busy job took the time to, to read it and give us some comments. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> All right, does anybody else have any questions? You all have heard that I <clears throat> hired this attorney. He's very good at what he does. Uh, and he's, uh, he has a way of reasoning things through that actually helped us very much in trying to resolve some of the issues that we had uh, and has worked very hard to keep us out of trouble. So um, anyway, I, I'd just like to thank everybody that came tonight uh, again. You all will be welcome to come back again on Monday. Uh, and once we get all the comments back, uh, I would obviously again uh, speak to your friends with your concerns and stuff and uh, invite them to come to on Monday evening at 6 30. We'll be right back here. So we'll do it all again. Thank you all.